what's up everybody EJ here and in this tutorial I'm going to show you how you can create a completely procedural mylar balloon setup with seams and all. I'll start by showing you how to set up your geometry you want to turn into a mylar balloon, show you the most important balloon simulation settings, how to make those nice seams, and then show you how to use the procedural setup for any other object. Then we'll close it out by adding a nice mylar balloon material using Redshift. Now if you want to follow along, you can support me by downloading the project files that I'm using in this video as well as my Mylar Balloon Pack. You can find that link in the description of this video. Alright, so let's get started and to do this whole effect that's going to be completely procedural Mylar Balloons, we're going to start with a spline. And I have some other splines here that I'm going to demonstrate with later, but I'm going to start out with a text spline first because we're going to have a spline that's going to not only be making our balloon geometry, but we're going to use the spline to drive a vertex map later. So it's very important we start out with a spline and not this text object that's already extruded. So with this text spline, let's just choose a letter. So let's go E and let's align this to the middle. And as always, we want to make sure that we're building things to real world scale when we're dealing with simulations or just lighting in general. So we'll get Bob the figure guy. You can see this is the size of like a six foot tall person. So this letter here, if we make this into a balloon, it's gonna be the same size as like a person. So let's bring this down to say like 70. So now it's like a somewhat big balloon that goes up to someone's knees. And so let's go and delete Bob the figure guy. Thank you. And then we can go zoom in here. And the key to making really nice Mylar balloons is you want a thicker font. So you can see this Sego, uh, if you have that on your computer. I also downloaded some other different options from Creative Cloud. Comes with a lot of awesome fonts. You can see we have this like rounded version here and this uh, like Omnis is pretty good too. Uh, so you can choose any type of font that is pretty thick. I'm going to go with this Ruika and uh, let's just go with this. And so what we can do at this point is let's throw this into an extrude object to extrude this out. And we just want to extrude this just a touch. So like 0.5. And then the other thing we want to do is we want to make this pretty symmetrical. So you can see we're extruding in the positive Z here. And so we're just going to offset this text spline just a little bit so it's completely aligned to the center of the Z axis there. And so if we extruded this 0.5, we're going to have that and go to 0.25 because I can do maths. And you can see this is now completely aligned at the Z axis here. So that's important for what we're going to do next. And what we're going to do next, if we go to display garage shading lines, you can see we only have subdivisions on the outside, but nothing on the inside. So we need more geometry to make a nice deformation with our simulation. So to do this, we're going to throw this extrude into a volume builder. And this is going to create some voxels and we'll make the voxel size pretty small, like 0.1. And then we can also place this into a volume measure and this will actually generate geometry off of those voxels and you see that this is a very dense mesh here and so what I'm going to do is just to round out the edges a little bit more here I'm going to go into the volume builder I'm going to go to SDF smooth and let's just bring this down a little bit and just smooth out those edges like so and I think that's looking pretty good and then at this point we can throw this into a remesher because this is way too dense of a mesh so if we go into our generators menu, go to remesh, place that volume measure in the remesh. And at this point, what we can do is change the mesh density. So we can go and cut this to like 50%. And you can see that this is going to cut this in half. And you can see it's taking a while to kind of do the remeshing here. So one thing you can really do to help this out when you're using a volume measure is we have all of this geometry here that's really a flat face here that we don't need. So what we can do is up the adaptive amount here by just a touch. So if I go 0.1, see how that keeps the nice density around the edges where it needs and where we don't need that extra information like on the front and the back, the flat parts of this object, it's actually removing and adaptively removing those polygons. So now we have less polygons to deal with from the get-go, so our remesher should work much faster. And since our object is symmetrical along the Z, we can turn on this symmetric Z and that will also help our remesher calculate this much faster. You can see how much faster that looks. And you can see that we have a much more dense mesh along the edges here. And that's because we have the adaptiveness on our remesh working. And we actually don't want that for simulations. We actually want a nice evenly subdivided object. So we're going to bring down this adaptiveness to zero. 
and now you'll see that we have nice evenly spaced polygons all over. Now depending on what type of object you're generating, you might see some weird pinching going on and stuff like that. When you see that, I recommend you adjusting the mesh density and try experimenting with different numbers to see if it fixes that issue. So remember the mesh density, the denser a mesh, the more fine details and wrinkles you will get. So if you want a lot more wrinkles with your Mylar balloon, maybe move this density to about 60. But we can leave it at that because this is all gonna be live. We can come back and change this later. So this is the benefit of using this very procedural setup. So now we got this remeshed letter E that's nicely subdivided. We can apply dynamics to this by right clicking on it, going to simulation tags and going to balloon. And so if I go ahead and I hit play now, you can see that our object's just gonna fall. And let's actually, while we're down here, let's give ourselves a bunch more frames to have the dynamic simulation play out in. So I'm gonna rewind and we're gonna turn off the gravity here. So I'm gonna hit control or command D to go to my project settings, navigate to the simulation tab, the scene tab, and then here's gravity. We're just gonna turn that off by entering zero and hitting enter. So if I hit play now, you can see that nothing's happening. So if I go into my balloon here and go into the balloon settings, here's where we can fill up our object with air, just like a balloon. It's very aptly named, but this overpressure value of one isn't really doing anything. It's kind of like the default state. It's not actually inflating this object at all. So if we want to inflate this, we can up this overpressure to like 10. You can see this expansion time is how many frames it's gonna take for the overpressure to reach its full amount. And now you can see we have this nice floaty little pillow, which is uh, you know kind of interesting. But what we need to do at this point is we need to pin down these edges here. And how we can pin down these edges is by using a vertex map and controlling not only the influence of the balloon, but what areas of our object are gonna be pinned down and not able to be affected with the balloon inflation, okay? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create a vertex map and we can do that by hitting Shift C to bring up the commander. And I'm just gonna type in vertex and you got vertex map here. I'm just gonna double click and then I'll apply a vertex map here. And here's where it's important that we used a text spline because what we can do at this point is go to our vertex map. If it's not on for you, just go and turn on this use fields and you can go to the fields tab and then just drag and drop that text spline down to here. And then if I select the text spline, we're gonna change this distance mode from a long to radius. And now we can control the radius of that vertex map that's based off of our spline here. So the thing to notice about vertex maps is whatever is red means 0% strength and whatever is yellow is 100% strength. So we actually need to invert this because we actually want 100% strength of our vertex map in the middle and 0% strength on the outside. So if I go to my basic tab here, go to invert, you can see what's going on now. You can see that's a very faint red there though. So what we can do at this point is just like using a levels adjustment to add some more contrast in Photoshop or After Effects, we can do the same thing here with our vertex map. And we can go into our menu here and grab a curve adjustment. And so I'm just gonna command or control click on this spline and just crush these values here. And you can see that's adding some contrast there, looking good. And so now we have our vertex map and what we can use this vertex map for is to pin down those areas of that vertex map that were red. So if I turn on this width force and then drag and drop the vertex map down to here. And if I hit play, you can see that the areas outside here are trying to stay where they initially are. And if we up this strength to 10, you can see this is acting as the old follow position, follow rotation of the old dynamics. You can see that this, these edges here, anything that's red here is getting that full influence and getting pinned down, okay? So if I hit play, you can see this is all right, this is looking okay but we're not getting any seams. We're not getting any like wrinkles or anything like that. So let's go and change a couple things. First off, let's go to the surface tab here and let's add some bendiness. I'm gonna bring this to a value of 150. So now we should start to get a little bit more wrinkles because we're allowing our, our particles that are driving the simulation to kind of create some bendiness there. But if we really wanna create some bendiness, we're gonna up this target length and watch what happens. If I just type in like 115, boom. Look at that, let me rewind here. And so what we're doing is this target length is allowing our polygons to stretch and grow beyond 100% of its original value to 150% of its original uh, size. So you can see that 
as we're doing that, we're adding all these really nice wrinkles and we can kind of fill this up even more now. So if we can change this to 15 and now we're inflating this even more, we're getting these really nice wrinkles. And what we can do at this point is we can go to our vertex map here and maybe we want a thicker seam. So because this is all live, we can go into the radius here and up this a little bit to a value of two. Another thing we can do is we can go and we can add a random field and change this to overlay. And if I go and I shrink the scale down, you can see we can kind of break up and make this a little bit more of an organic shape here. We can even go to the remapping and adjust the inner offset here to kind of crush those values there as well. You can adjust the overall opacity here. Again, just like, you know, Photoshop layers here. So there's a lot of things we can do with this random field. Maybe make this a little bit bigger. So what this is gonna allow us to do, watch what the wrinkles look like now. Now we have some little bit of variation where our seams are. But the seams are a little bit too stiff. So what's actually making the seam so stiff is the strength value here. So if we bring this strength value down to say five, you can see that's giving it a little bit more give and allowing our our seam here to kind of wrinkle a little bit there. But we're also seeing that this part of our object is getting inflated. So just like we used a vertex map to control the influence of what's getting pinned down, we can do the same thing and control where our object's getting inflated and where our object's not getting inflated. So this vertex map, again, if we want just the inflation to happen where everything's yellow and not red, what we can do is go to our simulation tag and drag and drop that vertex map right into that vertex map area there. And now if we hit play, you should see these seams aren't inflating anymore. And this is looking much, much nicer. So we have that nice vertex map in our balloon settings there that was just added in Cinema 4D 2023.2. So if you have an older version, you won't see this. So just update and you'll have this ability. But now at this point, this is where we can really start having fun. We can go into the text spline, say we really want a, a thicker uh, seam there. You can see that. Maybe we want a thinner seam. Let's go and bring this down to 1.5. And so this is completely procedural and art directable, which is really nice. You can adjust this curve here as well. And again, if we want even more kind of wrinkles on the edge there, we can go to the mix animation even bring this down to four, but you don't want to go too low because then you really don't have a seam much anymore. If you go really high, not really high, but like modestly high, you can see this just looks super, super stiff and kind of fake. Like you definitely want some kind of wrinkling to happen there. So I found like a value of eight somewhere in the middle there looks pretty good because now at least you have a little bit of this stuff moving there. I meant seven. And then let's maybe increase this to say 2.5. That's looking good. Now the true power of this whole setup is, okay, I want a different letter. Let's do D. That's gonna just pass its way all the way up to the remesh. There we go. Hit play. You can see that this vertex map is referencing this text spline. So whatever we change this spline to, it's gonna automatically update, which is super, super cool and so, so powerful. So we can have like a number in here too. Again, we're gonna let the remesh do its thing. It's really fast because we optimized it with the adaptive here and the mesher and boom, we got a number one. Hey, you know who's number one? Folks just like you who support me by dropping a like and a subscribe. Doing so alerts you anytime I drop new content and helps me grow my channel. And if you want to be the number one number one person, you can go ahead and leave me a nice comment in the comment section below. Now remember, if you don't have anything nice to say, just lie and say something nice anyways. Whoop, and we're getting a little bit of uh, stuff happening there. So if you see this kind of stuff happening, and this is just the nature of you're using different pieces of geometry. It might affect the simulation a little bit. So let's let's try to play around with the settings on our simulation here to try to mitigate some of the weird popping that might happen like that. So I'm going to hit Command or Control D to go to my scene wide simulation settings. Go to simulation and let's up the smoothing iterations and let's up the damping to say 20. So this is going to remove energy from the particles that's driving the simulation. And another thing we want to prevent at all costs is collision. So I'm gonna up this to four and four. 
and maybe even up the sub steps to like 30 so we'll have a much more accurate simulation and so now let's hit play and you can see that do we have any more jitter no we do not so we fixed that jitter issue and so what we can do now at this point is we can go in here and kind of adjust the seam there maybe make it even bigger and so this is just such a super powerful, look at the nice edges we're getting along the uh, seam there. And so we can make this even nicer looking by going into our subdivision surface, adding our remesh to the subdivision surface. And look at how nice, let me get out of my garage shading with lines here. And just look at how nice this looks. So if you want to use this, as like some kind of design asset. You can make everything in here editable by right clicking and going to current state to object. Now we'll bake down this object as a piece of geometry that you can do whatever you want to it. By the way, if you're new to Cinema 4D or you wanna get a little bit more in depth into learning Cinema 4D, check out my courses over at schoolofmotion.com. If you use promo code iDesign100, you can save $100 on either of my Cinema 4D courses. All right, let's get back into it. Now, again, if you want even more fine-tuned details, we go into Remesh, and let's turn back on Garage Shading with Lines. Say, we, I want even more wrinkles. Let's bring up the mesh density to 75. So again, this is all live, and we don't have to change another thing about this, and hit play, and see what this looks like. Okay, so now we're getting even more wrinkles, and that's looking that you might like that, you might not like that. Turn on the subdivision surface, see what that looks like. Maybe at this point we're like, you know what, that uh, radius of the seam is too big, so we'll just bring that back. Boom, do it again. All right, that's looking a little bit better. And so this is so incredibly powerful. It's like I'm in uh, Houdini or something with the uh, amount of proceduralness, proceduralness, sure that you, you have here. Now, uh, if you want to use something other than a text spline, like I have this little bubble here, little talk bubble, what we can do here is just place this bubble in the extrude, and then what we need to do is just simply update this from the text spline to this bubble spline. So all I'm gonna do is drag and drop this bubble, hover over the text spline and release my mouse, and that'll just replace it, replace that spline field and you can see that updated here. And now I hit play. And now you see we have this really cool inflation on this object here. It's going a little slow. So uh, what we need to do at this point, let's just bring back, let me turn off the subdivision surface first. Let's bring this back down to like 60. Let's hit play. And depending on the object that you're using, you might need to up the balloon because we have a lot more volume here to fill. So let's bring this up to like 25. That's not gonna be enough. Let's do like 45 and there we go. Because we have a bigger volume to fill, we need to up that pressure. And now we can see that we probably also need to adjust some of these values here as well. So maybe a radius of four. And then for the mix animation, maybe we need to up this a little bit too. So again, depending on the volume of your object, you might need to adjust some of these things. So as long as you understand what this is doing, like what is this doing? Well, it's helping pin those edges that are being driven by that vertex map here. Okay, so whatever's red is gonna get pinned. And this is the strength of that pin. So if you have a low strength like two, we're not gonna get a seam really. Okay, so the more we up this, and you can actually see this live in the viewport as I'm upping this to a higher amount, you can see we're getting different varying amounts of wrinkles and, and different looking seams here. So this is all live, all procedural. If we want to do this heart here, let's see what this looks like. So we can go and let's just replace the bubble with the heart. Boop. Just turn off these splines here so now we have the remesh doing its thing sometimes you need to jog the memory of the remesh and i like to turn it on and off again if it just gets stuck in this blue state and so nb there's our mesh hit play boom we got a heart i do have a heart 
And so again, because this is a little bit of a different volume, we maybe need to bring down the balloon over pressure. And so you get the point, right? <laughs> so this is kind of the really awesome procedural setup to create a Mylar balloon. And it's so much better than what I had before uh, using older versions of Cinema 4D. Again, I have like an older tutorial doing the same thing and it had it was using the dresser here and that's kind of, it's not procedural at all. Uh, so this is just a really cool method to be able to create all of these really cool Mylar balloon effects. All right, so now that we have these Mylar balloon looks and we can make whatever type of Mylar balloon we want, how do we texture this to look like that nice Mylar balloony kind of look? So it's actually a fairly easy thing to do. First thing I'm gonna do is make sure I'm in Redshift Render. And then there's actually a really good preset in the Asset Manager here. And so the Asset Manager is continually getting updated and there's some really good like Redshift presets and stuff like that. But there is a Metal Material. So I'm gonna type in Metal, go to Material, and I believe anything with the redshift icon is a redshift ready material. So let's actually go, I think it's Chrome. Let's actually do Chrome. There we go. And so Chrome is the exact thing that I want to use. So we got like a Chrome, two different types of Chrome. I'm not sure what's what. I think this might be a little bit more blurry. But I'm just going to drag and drop this and apply this directly to my object here. And you can already see. In the viewport, we got this really nice look going on. And if we want to change the color, we just go into our object here and go to our standard material and just change the color to say like red because we got or pink. Actually, no red because we got a red heart. And we'll just sample this color for the reflection color. And let's go in. You can see we got a really nice reflection in the viewport, but if we went to go and use our IPR, you can see we don't have any lights in our scene. We have nothing in our scene to reflect our Mylar balloon. So what we need to do, let's go and grab a dome light first. And so what we can do again is dive into the asset browser here again, search for HDR and we'll get HDR eyes here and something, uh, let's go with something like this. And we'll drag and drop this in the texture here. And you might need to download on your end. So if you got the little download cloud, you'll need to download it first. But there we go. We have that HDRI there. You can see it in the background. You see that nice reflection. And so let's actually turn this background off. And let's go to Redshift IPR. And voila, we got a really nice looking Mylar balloon. Now, of course, you don't want to just use a dome light or an HDR to light your scene. So we can throw in some other area lights in here. Let's actually turn off the IPR. Here's our area light. I'm gonna move this over here. Command click and drag, duplicate it, move this over here. So with fully reflective objects, you wanna set up your scene with objects for your object, your fully reflective object to reflect. Kinda makes sense, right? Now we can start the IPR again. And you can see those soft boxes, those area lights in there. And again, more art direction, get this looking exactly the way you want it to look, change the color of the lights, make it nice and pretty, whatever you want to do, make your own happy lights. And that there is how you make a nice Mylar balloon, procedural Mylar balloon in Cinema 4D. So there you have it, how to create a nice procedural Mylar balloon setup. Now this is actually a remix of an old tutorial of mine. I'd love to hear if you have any tutorials of mine that are super old, that need to be updated, that you wanna see me update next. Any simulation stuff, anything like that. Definitely leave me a comment in the comment section. Let me know what you're looking for. What's your number one choice for a remix tutorial? All right, that's gonna do it for me. Thanks so much for watching this tutorial. Hope to see you again in a tutorial real soon. Until next time, Go out and make something.